you know, my own judgment as an election law professor is that that ought to get litigated and resolved before the presidential primaries begin in New Hampshire or elsewhere. You, you shouldn't play gotcha with the voters after they've cast their votes, after the electors have voted. Now for Congress on January 6th to say, we don't have any dispute with the ballots cast, either the popular votes or the electoral votes. We just think the person that they were cast for can't serve. That, that seems to me a m nightmare scenario that should be avoided and, and should be uh, handled long before you get to January 6th. So, you know, I understand why the, the House report is trying to, to take account of these other kinds of objections, but I think some additional thought has to be given to what objections really deserve to be considered on January 6th versus what kinds of issues should be handled well in advance. I'm Scott R. Anderson. And this is the Lawfare Podcast for January 24th, 2022. As the prospect of broader election reform has grown more remote, bipartisan discussions have increasingly come to center on one long-standing law, the Electoral Count Act of 1887. Designed to regulate the process through which Congress counts electoral votes, ambiguities in this antiquated law have been a frequent source of anxiety, most recently in the wake of the 2020 election when many feared outgoing President Trump would successfully capitalize on them to prevent the certification of his loss. To discuss the Electoral Count Act and its potential reform, I sat down with Ned Foley, a professor at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law and a leading expert in election law. We discussed the origins of the act, a recent congressional report outlining possible reforms, and what limits the Constitution may put on what reform can accomplish. It's the Lawfare Podcast for January 24th. Ned Foley on Electoral Count Act Reform. So, Ned, as we're recording this, there is a big, by some measures, historical debate happening on the floor of the Senate over the Democrats' fairly expansive uh, voting package and filibuster reform and a lot of other measures that are kind of tied in with that package. But over the last few weeks where people have been discussing the wide range of measures that have kind of been on the table in regards to election reform from a variety of different perspectives, really for, for the entirety of the Biden administration so far, we've also heard another old issue that we spent a lot of time on in advance of the 2020 election percolate back up. And that's the question of the Electoral Count Act, this law that's been around for over 100 years that is intended at least, uh, and to some extent does help define how Congress goes about its constitutional responsibility to count the electoral votes that are cast for the presidency. And, and it looks like there is, at least from media reporting, you know, a public appetite for reforming the Electoral Count Act to avoid manipulations of the type that gave lots of people heartburn in advance of 2020. An appetite, I should note, on both sides of the aisle, both among Democrats and Republicans. So this is an area where there is cautious optimism that a legislative package could be enacted to fix these things in advance of 2024. For our listeners who might not be able to, to think back and recall with real detail our numerous and numerous discussions about this in advance of, of 2020 election, Help us refresh a little bit. Where did the Electoral Count Act come from? What were the problems it was intended to address? And kind of how does it go about doing so? Sure. Thanks, Scott. And thanks for having me to talk about this. So the Electoral Count Act was adopted in 1887. And that was basically 10 years after the huge disputed election of 1876. This was Hayes versus Tilden during Reconstruction. And, you know, we could go into the details of that ugly dispute and why it was so consequential. But a decade later, Congress passed this law to regulate the counting of electoral votes. And it took 10 years because it's a hard topic. And Congress worked at it during that time. And finally, they said, we need some statute. We can't go into another presidential election you know, without something that gives us procedures. And so that's why it was adopted when it was. So there's kind of a, a number of big chunks of the Electoral Count Act, which is, it's worth noting, has, has stayed kind of in its current form since it was enacted. It's now 
distributed across some early sections of the U.S. code, but still with its very 19th century statutory drafting sort of language, which can often be a little convoluted and hard to parse by our, our contemporary standards. But I kind of want to dig into a few of the big provisions to give the listener a sense of what they are and how they operate. The first one, I think, is is the one that gets talked about a lot, maybe the most out of the act and was a big deal 20 plus years ago in the Bush v. Gore debate. And that's the safe harbor provision. Tell us a little bit about the safe harbor provision and and what it does and, and what it's intended to do and what it does successfully or unsuccessfully. Yeah, so I think you're exactly right that the safe harbor provision is really important. And its goal was to try to have disputes resolved in the states. You know, our electoral college system is really a state-based system. I mean, many of us might prefer to elect presidents based on a national popular vote or some other method, but the Constitution does specify the electoral college system, and that means there are really, you know, 51 separate elections because the District of Columbia participates. And the Electoral Count Act was built on that philosophy. And because the Hayes-Tilden dispute of 1876 that I mentioned was so ugly and precarious and almost caused the Second Civil War, when Congress got engulfed in, in a real fight that took, you know, months and almost you know, again, it was very, very ugly. The, the philosophy of the safe harbor provision in particular was if we can possibly isolate these disputes on a state by state basis and have them resolved at the state level in state courts or state canvassing boards or whatever, let's let state law handle this and then Congress will be bound by whatever the states do. But the states have to comply with a couple of conditions in the so-called safe harbor provision to get the benefit of that philosophy. So the most important one is that states have to use laws adopted before election day. They can't change the rules for counting votes after the ballots have been cast. So if they use pre-existing state law and they achieve a final adjudication, that final adjudication is supposed to be binding on Congress. And then the other element of the statute as it currently exists is this six-day period of time between the so-called safe harbor deadline and then when the electors themselves meet to cast their electoral votes. And and I think that six days is a product of the fact that it's a 19th century law, as you mentioned. It was built for a different era, pre-internet, you know, pre-television. And and so there was some sense that you, you know, if, if there was going to be litigation over counting ballots, you needed six days before the electors who were appointed based on all that litigation could get themselves to their state capitals by, you know, railroad or horse and buggy or whatever to cast their electoral votes. I think that six days may be a little antiquated, but it is a feature of the current law. And it's worth noting here, I think, just to take a little step back to the constitutional framework that... The Constitution doesn't actually dictate how states determine or appoint their electors. Isn't that right? You know, that while now every state in the District of Columbia have adopted elections, popular elections or democratic elections, I should say, as a means of doing that, that hasn't necessarily been the case throughout all all of U.S. history and isn't constitutionally required. So, So when we get to this provision, it's about the state rule of law being applied, but not necessarily a guarantee of democracy being the method by which states necessarily use that. Instead, it's really just solidifying that whatever the rules are, they have to be established before election day. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. Again, that's a feature of the Constitution that I wish we would update to guarantee that we, the citizens, get to choose our president. But you know, unfortunately, the Constitution doesn't give us that guarantee. As you say, thankfully, all states for a long time now have used a popular vote as the basis for appointing electors. But the Constitution is clear that state legislatures can choose whatever method of appointment they want, including direct appointment of electors by the legislatures themselves, as some did in early American history. Now, I think that's unlikely to happen. And I think we can you know, pretty well rely that we're still going to have popular votes in all of the states. But 
it also means that states get to choose exactly how they conduct their popular vote and how they count their popular vote. And the electoral count is built on the assumption that this is largely driven by state law. So the second big thing that the Electoral Count Act does is establish this set of counting rules, as they're often referred to. And I think this is the provision that when people talk about how confusing and poorly written the Electoral Count Act is, this is the provision they're referring to, because it is a a long block paragraph slash run-on sentence uh, or pairing of run-on sentences that kind of lays out a series of conditions for how Congress is supposed to dispose of different scenarios where a state may submit different slates of electors based on internal disputes or other disagreements and, and how Congress is going to deal with it. Tell us a little bit about, about this provision, how it's been applied and how useful it's been and some of the problems it's, it's raised. Yeah. I mean, if, if listeners want to Google and look it up, I think they would be surprised by just how convoluted and confusing it is. You, you really need to kind of try to flow chart and diagram it. And even when you try to do it, you, you're, you're, you're left kind of circling back on yourself and not sure <laughs> whether you're in a maze that you can't get out of, unfortunately. So, And that in and of itself, I believe, is a serious problem because to me, the most important value for a statute of this type is clarity and so that there's no doubt in Congress about what to do in counting electoral votes. So to the extent that there's confusion, that's counterproductive, I think, to the whole goal of, of the statute. But but that's what we have. Now, as you say, you know, there's two basic situations to envision. The first is if there's only a single submission of electoral votes from any given state. So one package comes from the state and Congress receives the package, opens it up and presumably counts it. And the statute is, is based on a philosophy that it should be presumed that you 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 count the electoral votes sent from a state if, if there's a single submission. Uh, the other scenario is I think the one the statute was written f- more with it in mind because it was what happened back in 1876, that decade earlier, which is their rival submissions uh, from the same state, uh, which is obviously a situation fraught with peril because, you know, take Pennsylvania, for example, if, if two different documents come from Pennsylvania, each bearing some official indication from a part of state government that they're really entitled to speak for Pennsylvania, then Congress does have to figure out, well, which one is the real document from Pennsylvania that gets to qualify as Pennsylvania's electoral votes. So I think part of what makes that provision so convoluted and complicated is it's trying to imagine, you know, all the different permutations that might arise in that rival submission scenario. And that kind of brings us actually to the third big thing the Electoral Count Act does, at least in my mind, which is that when Congress, and this is both chambers kind of coming together to count the electoral votes to determine who becomes uh, or who's in position to become the next president, vice president, there is often a process by which you have objections that can be raised or raised and that then are uh, adjudicated and debated in a particular way with the, you know, the vice president uh, constitutionally chairing the proceedings. Um, but what the Electoral Count Act does is essentially overlays atop of the kind of bare bones constitutional requirements for that process and lays in a couple of other procedural requirements, in one part constraining the role of the vice president to some substantial degree, and another part dictating specific ways how the House and Senate debate when there are objections, and then setting sort of gateway requirements for raising objections. Tell us a little bit about how the Electoral Count Act shapes this objection process, the actual debate that happens at the Electoral Count voting session that happens you know, in January before a presidential inauguration. Yeah. So, and here's where, if if we're looking to head to think about how to maybe improve the Electoral Count Act, one point that may be worth keeping in mind is the relationship of this procedural mechanism of having objections to what you might call the substantive principles and rules for what what ought to be objected to or, or what should be considered out of bounds as a type of objection. Because I think one of the deficiencies of the statute 
that was adopted in 1887 and that we still have to this day is the clearest part of the statute are the procedures to how to lodge an objection. And it's relatively easy to lodge an objection. All you need is one senator and one representative. So one person from each chamber, they have to do it in writing. But as long as you meet that very low threshold, it triggers a process that causes the two chambers to separate because they start in this special joint session presided over by the vice president and the packages are open. But if you get an objection, then uh, the chambers divide and deliberate separately for two hours on each objection. So again, you know it's two hours, you know they separate, you know it only takes one member of each chamber to, to do that. And I think the clarity of those procedures is sort of in a counterproductive way is kind of invited objections. Whereas I think the philosophy of the statute was actually to minimize objections. And again, if the states resolve disputes themselves, you weren't really supposed to object to any dispute that achieved a resolution in the states. And yet, you know, starting in, you mentioned 2000, Bush versus Gore, you know, there was an objection. It didn't get a senator signing, but House members objected to the submission of electoral votes on behalf of Bush after the Supreme Court and ruled and so forth. And that, you know, even if a senator had joined, it was not an objection that was philosophically consistent with the safe harbor provision, because as listeners may remember, the reason why the safe harbor concept came up in the Supreme Court was that Florida had wanted to take advantage of safe harbor. And that was, and and once the Supreme Court ruled, it did meet the safe harbor requirement. So that meant there shouldn't have been any objection whatsoever. It just you, you count the votes that meet the safe harbor standard. And yet there was an objection. Likewise, in 2004, there was no doubt that electoral votes from the state of Ohio on behalf of Bush also satisfied the safe harbor requirement. But nonetheless, um, there was an objection. And in that case, you had a senator as well as a representative sign the objection that triggered the process. But the objection was sort of out of bounds substantively and yet it went forward because it met the minimum procedural threshold. Same thing in 2016, there was objections to electoral votes on behalf of President Trump that, again, didn't get a senator signing on, but there was no doubt about the safe harbor status of those submissions. And of course, the same type of objection is what caused all the problems in 2020. Again, namely, objections went forward in this case, again, signed by a senator as well as a representative, notwithstanding the fact that the electoral votes from Arizona and Pennsylvania and elsewhere, you know, had safe harbor status. So so one of the things that we have to keep in mind is what is the relationship of the procedural rules for filing an objection and then deliberating on them in this way that the chambers divide? But you that process shouldn't be set in motion unless you've got a an objection that should be cognizable given the function of the statute in the first place. So a perennial question around the Electoral Count Act has been, uh, and this was particularly relevant in the debates leading up to 2020, this question of to what extent Congress can actually enact statutes on all or any of the questions the Electoral Count Act purports to address. Because a number of them relate to what are the internal proceedings of a uh, somewhat odd, but nonetheless a session of Congress, you know, this kind of joint session where both the House and the Senate sit together uh, when they're not splitting up to debate um, separately uh, measures as kind of spelled out in the Electoral Count Act. And this comes up in other contexts as well, where we see legislation that purports to set forward legislative procedures. Uh, and there is a, a constitutional question. I think it generally gets decided in favor of the perspective that those, and sometimes expressly by Congress, it's worth noting in the actual legislation itself, says these are exercises of Congress's rulemaking authority, not necessarily its legislative authority. So they can be superseded by each individual chamber, or in this case, I suppose, both chambers together, deciding we're actually going to use different rules for this procedure. So we define our own rules under the Constitution. We can't be bound by a prior Congress. And then there's a separate question as well about, well, Congress also gives certain roles to the vice president. So what are the constitutional limits 
to, to the extent to which Congress can constrain them, and then perhaps even in a joint session, can the House and Senate together constrain them, uh, even if not through legislation, through the rules uh, that are adopted in advance of that sort of joint session. What do you make of some of those arguments? How big and serious a constraint are they on how effective an electoral count act can be? And how do you operate in that sort of environment if there are real constitutional limits, there are at least serious enough possibility of constitutional limits that you have to take it into account? Yeah, it's a can of worms, isn't it? Um, my own view is that Congress does have constitutional power to write a statute under the Necessary and Proper Clause to implement the 12th Amendment. And as you said, the 12th Amendment is not very detailed in, into how the joint session is supposed to work. And so, you know, we think of the Necessary Proper Clause supplementing the Constitution. And so as long as the statute that Congress writes is not antithetical to the 12th Amendment itself or the basic structure of the Electoral College and federalism, I would think there is some power of Congress to try to implement the design of the 12th Amendment. But as you indicated, you know, there are serious scholars and others who, who, who believe that because this is a Congress that we're talking about, even if it's a special joint session, Congress can't bind itself in this way by statute, and it has to be, you know, by the rulemaking, the rulemaking power of, of Congress for each chamber to, to govern itself by its own internal rules. And so I think the, the best way to avoid any serious problem is to continue the practice that Congress has adopted, which is that prior to each January 6th joint session, each chamber of Congress adopts what's called a concurrent resolution agreeing to follow the procedures of the ECA itself. So it's sort of a belt and suspenders approach. It's like, okay, you know, we're a little nervous about the constitutional uh, status of this statute, but we like the fact that it gives us procedures to rely upon. And so we'll just uh, agree for this year to abide by those procedures. So I think in thinking about revising the ECA, the process should be mindful of the fact that it, it's going to be necessary for each chamber to adopt those kinds of concurrent resolutions in the future. So revise the statute with the goal of maximizing the chance that the, that each chamber will be willingly adopting those sorts of concurrent resolutions and not want to say, oh, now let's this is the year that we want to test our power to deviate from the statute and just do our own thing, because I think that would create a crisis atmosphere, you know, a couple of weeks before Inauguration Day. So I, I think given the this constitutional question lurking in the background, we can't avoid it completely. We just hope that best practices, you know, minimize the risk of, of a problem. You know, th there is this question about whether or not any of this is justiciable in, in federal court if there was a fight. And that raises something that listeners may know of as the political question doctrine, um, something that, that hasn't been tested in this context. So, you know, if, if Congress has an Electoral Count Act on the books, whether the current one or a revised one, and then a, a chamber tried to deviate from it saying, well, we can't be bound by this statute, you know, could one side or the other go to court and get a ruling, you know, presumably from the Supreme Court, answering this constitutional question, yes, you are bound by the statute, or no, you're not. I'd like to think we could avoid that kind of litigation, but there's a risk of, of it being out there unresolved in the way I just described. So because we are now at the point where we are seeing people turn to kind of, I guess, a more lower common denominator approach to to addressing some of the problems that came out of the 2020 election. Electoral Count Act reform is on the table in a serious way. People are talking about considering it. And we saw kind of the first big offering coming from folks in Congress on that last week. We saw a report put together by the majority staff of the Committee on House Administration, chaired by uh, Congressman Zoe Lofgren, that put together a set of proposals for reform of the Electoral Count Act that I think is useful in that it surveys a lot of proposals, obviously has picked a few that that they find persuasive, but is kind of a first offering in the conversation. And I wanted to look at that a little bit with you and get a sense of your reaction to some of these proposals um, that might be or might end up being the Democrats' first salvo, if you will. 
it's worth noting, I should say, there's a bunch of smaller level reforms it notes that are addressing issues that are significant, but but kind of a little more lower caliber. It wants to extend the election calendar to allow more time for resolving disputes at the kind of the state level, clarify the denominator, because there's there's still an outstanding question from an ambiguity in the Constitution about you know how whether you're counting the electoral votes that counted out of the total number of potential electoral votes or the only the number that were appointed by the states, which may be smaller if there's a dispute or some other error in process. Also clarifying the scope of election day, whether that does in fact, as some people argued in the last election, impose a legal barrier on the early voting and mail mail in voting, other measures that allow people to vote on different days. But we're not I don't want to get in those. I want to focus on kind of the big ones that get at these big issues the Electoral Count Act tries to reform. The first thing it really tries to do, as I understand it, is to first raise the threshold for objections in that joint session of the House and Senate, basically saying that you, instead of saying you just need one congressman, one member of the House of Representatives, one senator, you in fact need a third and a third, a uh, very, very substantial raising of the objections. And then it pairs that with a real dramatic narrowing of the VP role uh, as kind of the chair of the session building on what the Electoral Count Act has done to try and really hand the authority actually more over to the president pro tempore of the Senate on the logic that that person has never previously been a candidate for office and therefore is less likely to pose the same issues. And even then, I think providing them due to some other rules changes we'll talk about in a second, a a fairly constrained role because of a narrower universe of the size of objections. How does that strike you as a solution in terms of reconfiguring the way the objections process and the chairing of the objections process operates? Is that a plausible approach or, or is that likely to encounter some problems or it be ineffective? So a couple of things. One is I think the report that was released was extremely helpful and, and very well done and, and is a useful baseline for further conversations. And and I also think the philosophy of the report in, in what it's trying to do is 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 the right philosophy. Um I might quibble with some details, but but there are two values that I have front in mind in terms of thinking about. Electoral Count Act reform. Uh, w- one value is clarity, and the other value is bipartisanship. So I think the the most important thing that a well written Electoral Count Act can do is be as crystal clear as possible. No ambiguity. Everybody knows what the answer is: who won the election is, and who gets to be inaugurated. And it's designed for a situation where obviously there's a fight about that. And Ultimately, every election has to have a losing side, right? And and so what you want the Electoral Count Act to do is to have the losing side grumble and not be happy, but realize that the answer is the answer, and there's another election in four years that you hope you can win again. So clarity, clarity, clarity as most important thing. And then the second value, again, I, I think for reasons that we were already talking about how each chamber has to embrace the Electoral Count Act in that concurrent resolution. I think the Electoral Count Act, if it's going to be revised now in advance of 2024, has to have sufficient acceptance from both political parties that they feel like it was an agreement that they were participants to and they like the new procedures, which is why they're going to abide by them. So I'm less concerned with particular details on what the revision looks like if it can meet those two criteria, right? In other words, if it's absolutely clear and both political parties agree with it, almost anything else I I might say about it is less important. (laughs) But having said that, I'm happy to speak to particular issues uh, to offer my thoughts. But again, if, if both sides disagree with me and they're clear about it, you know, hallelujah, that's much better than anything that I could think. On the specifics of ra- raising the threshold, I think that's a good idea. Uh, you know, it could be a third of each chamber, it could be a quarter. I- I'm not sure the exact threshold matters, but I think raising the threshold is an important signal that we we want serious objections and only serious objections. We We don't want political posturing or protest objections, you know, this is not the context in which we should be, you know, monkeying around with the presidential election process. It's too important to to have stability in this context. And so I think raising the threshold for objections is an excellent idea. 
the idea of replacing the vice president with the Senate president pro tem, that I'm not in favor of for this reason. I think a well-designed electoral count act should be built on the philosophy that there's an extremely limited role, both for Congress itself and the vice president. So it's not just that the vice president isn't entitled to pick the winner and and has a circumscribed role. Congress itself, given the electoral college structure that we talked about, Congress is is not a national recount board. Its job is not to relitigate who won the popular vote in any state. All Congress is supposed to really figure out here is do they have the electoral votes that the state wanted to send? That's why if there's a single submission that comes from some part of the state government, there really should be no objection at all because there's no dispute coming from the state, the state of Pennsylvania or Arizona, whatever, saying here's our electoral votes. There's no second alternative claiming to speak for the state. So Congress shouldn't be second guessing the appointment of the electors when the state is unified in its submission. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in the more fraught, perilous situation of a rival submissions, Congress's job isn't to pick the correct submission, correct in terms of counting the popular vote, correct in terms of the proper application of state law. The only thing Congress really is supposed to do is figure out under which of these two submissions is entitled to speak for the state because it is the proper submission given what state law is on that topic. So uh, so Congress's role is very limited or should be, and so is the, the vice president. I mention all that now because I'm sympathetic to why you are worried about the vice president, you know, who might be a candidate for re-election or, re- you know, election as president in this decisive role, but it shouldn't be decisive. And the 12th Amendment is written in such a way that you could make the constitutional argument that whether you like it or not, you can't replace the vice president with anybody else as the presiding officer of the joint session. The 12th Amendment talks about the Senate president you know, receiving the electoral votes from the states and opening them up and the votes get counted. And while there's ambiguity there, you you can make the argument that that contemplates that the Senate president is the presiding officer. Now, occasionally we've had a Senate president who is not the vice president because the vice president has been deceased in history and hasn't been, you know, there's no new vice president. And then you would have the Senate president pro tem. But when there is a vice president in the United States, they are entitled to be under the Constitution, the Senate president. And so, you know, if the vice president shows up at the joint session and says, I'm the Senate president and therefore I preside as the Senate president, you know, th- there's a, a constitutional claim that that's correct. And, and I just think you should reduce any possible argument that the Electoral Count Act is unconstitutional and, and trying to swap out the vice president for somebody else, I think, invites a problem that you don't need to invite. Well, you anticipated kind of the other, the next big move that this set of proposals does, which is that it really does try and get the state action on this down to one single slate of electors, you know, to eliminate the multiple slate issue. That is really what the Electoral (laughs) Count Act is designed to address, really it's one of the big challenges designed to address. And so this proposal would do that by essentially saying that the governor of each state has until a date fixed at which they are supposed to certify a particular electoral count result for their state. And that if they fail to do that by that date, it would give a cause of action to the candidates to compel the governor to do so, or if the governor refuses to get a court, a federal court to step in and say, okay, somebody else has to do this for the governor because he's not fulfilling his legal duty. So interestingly, you know, I, what I, I take this to mean is that it's essentially saying if so far as there is confusion or doubt about the proper electors, it's we're going to shove that into the courts to resolve by a particular date. And that's kind of also why they want to extend the election calendar. It seems just to allow extra time past the safe harbor deadline that's in the current Electoral Count Act, which is you know, several weeks before the actual Electoral Count Day in Congress on January 6th or thereabouts to instead allow extra time for what I take to be the courts to really resolve this issue and get down to 
one slate of electors that then the governor will be compelled to issue or somebody in the governor's stead. Essentially, that takes the Congress largely out of the business of doing the substantive evaluation, as you note. It sounds like you think that's a good idea, but is is the court route, if I'm reading its, this proposal correctly, um, the right way to do that? Or is there some other mechanism we should be turning to instead? Yeah, so you're right. I mean, I do think this is the right philosophy for the revision of the statute to take. You know, so I, you know, I applaud the House report for that approach. And I do think the courts play a key role in this process. I think, again, there may be some quibbles about the details of how to achieve this philosophy, but, but also the idea of, a, of an absolute deadline in terms of timing is constitutionally required. I, the, the Article 2 of the Constitution says that the electors uh, must meet on the same day in every state. Congress can pick the date, but it has to be uniform throughout the United States. And so that means any issues regarding an appointment of an elector has to be resolved before the electors meet on that nationally uniform date. So that that's the deadline. And and, and again, you, it might make sense to make the date that the electors meet instead of being mid-December, the end of December or early January to, to give the state some more, more time. You know, I, the, the way I think of this is there's really two phases to this whole process. The first phase is between what we all call election day that's in the beginning of November where we as citizens cast our popular votes. And that first phase ends, you know, with the appointment of the electors based on that popular vote and the electors casting their electoral votes. And, you know, if there's a dispute about that, there can be recounts or litigation in courts and state court, federal court, or whatever, but all of that has to get resolved before the electors themselves meet and cast their electoral votes. And so I think the right philosophy is to, is to get that resolved definitively in the states through courts, including federal courts if necessary. So there's just a single answer as to who are the electors of each state that get to cast their electoral votes on that nationally uniform day. And then phase two is the transmission of those electoral votes from the states to Congress opened up and counted on on January 6th or at the joint session on the 12th Amendment. And what I think is the right philosophy that's embraced in this House report and and what a well-designed Electoral Count Act would do would basically say, there's really no role for Congress. Again, once you know what who the electors are, that was for the states to appoint their own electors. So Congress doesn't get to undermine the state's appointment of its own electors. It just simply has to identify, you know, who were the electors that were appointed. And if that's the approach and the statute is clear enough, then you won't have objections of the kind that occurred in 2000 and 2004 and 2016 or 2020. All of those objections were out of bounds under the appropriate philosophy as embraced in this document. So the the last big chunk of this, that this proposal from the Command House Administration approaches or engages on is the objections process, not the process. We've already talked about, I guess, the threshold and the VP's role, but the substantive scope of objections, I should say. Because as as you, you've described, the philosophy behind this is really to try and limit the scope of objections as much as you can, right? Like you're not really, Congress should be getting out of the business of substantively evaluating this. It's, Constitution makes it the state's job to determine who their electors are. But there are still some outstanding questions that the report seems to acknowledge could very well have to be dealt with through the congressional objections process. Uh, The big ones it points to are constitutional ineligibility, either of the candidate or of particular electors. Uh, There are a handful of others there as well. And it says, well, you know, we're going to have to have some process and these are a valid basis for objections. But, um, you know, otherwise that it kind of is is, is very narrow about anticipating this. The other one, it it notes that is a 
inherently a little more open ended. I'm not sure they're able to pare it down that well as allegations of corruption, um, that there is some corrupt process or other sort of illegal conduct. I suppose you would throw certain potentially like unconstitutional conduct um, or conduct violative of federal law potentially in this bucket as well, where a state process might arrive at an outcome as a sole outcome that nonetheless is not consistent with federal law uh, or not consistent with, I guess, principles of anti-corruption that uh, may or may not be codified in that particular cognizable way in federal law. How, how do you approach the substantive scope of these objections? You know, given your your philosophical bent towards trying to narrow Congress's role, how far can that go? What is the substantive scope Congress needs to keep um, for these sorts of objections, particularly around that corruption question? How do you how do you approach that? How should Congress be thinking about that? And does the committee strike that balance properly? Yeah, so I think analytically, there's sort of two types of objections. One is over the appointment of electors themselves, which is what we've been mostly talking about so far. And again, in in a world where electors are appointed based on the popular vote, the objections would be based on the counting of the popular vote. And and again, I I, I agree with the philosophy, you know, confine that to any litigation that needs to occur before the electors themselves meet through state or federal court, like we've talked about. The second type of objection is that even if you know who the electors properly are, because they were properly appointed based on the popular vote, you've got a problem with the electoral votes that they cast. And what's really dangerous about that, I mean, I don't know that you can completely eliminate the risk of this kind of situation, but but I think one has to think about it because now we're stipulating that we've had valid popular votes in all you know, 50 states in the District of Columbia. And we've we've got duly appointed electors who have cast their electoral votes. And now somebody in Congress doesn't want to count them, despite, you know, democracy, small d, kind of having worked at the state level. So, you know, any objection at this point, if it was going to be successful, would not be in the service of, you know, a sell, you know voters' choice. It would be to undo what what the voters did. Um, Barring, you know, there is the so-called faithless elector situation, but states are trying to lock down that so that electors really follow the popular vote. One example that I'm worried about looking ahead to 2024 is, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, including uh, at Lawfare doing great work on the issue of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and whether or not someone is disqualified from holding federal office if they participated in an insurrection, having taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. And there are other ways in which a candidate for president might not be eligible to be inaugurated according to constitutional rules. For example, if Barack Obama ran for a third term, you know, voters may really want to cast a ballot for him, but you only get to have two terms by virtue of the term limit amendment, you know, that was adopted after FDR. You know, the, the, there was obviously the spurious claim that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. And from time to time, there have been challenges to, or at least questions raised about other presidential candidates, whether they are eligible to be president because were they really born in the United States? In a world where we want democracy, small d, and we want we want to inaugurate a president that the voters have chosen, you know, my own judgment as an election law professor is that that ought to get litigated and resolved before the presidential primaries begin in New Hampshire or elsewhere. You you shouldn't play gotcha with the voters after they've cast their votes, after the electors have voted. Now for Congress on January 6th to say, we don't have any dispute with the ballots cast, either the popular votes or the electoral votes. We just think the person that they were cast for can't serve. That, that seems to me a m- nightmare scenario that should be avoided and, and should be uh, handled long before you get to January 6th. So, you know, I understand why the the House report is trying to, to take account of these other kinds of objections, but I think some additional thought has to be given to what objections really deserve to be considered on January 6th versus what kinds of issues should be handled well in ad- advance. So, We've got the set of proposals. We don't know if this is going to be the thing that 
you know, drive the conversation. Um, obviously, there's the views of one set of committee staff and chair in one committee in the House. But it's a good starting point. I think by virtue of having kind of a, the first one through the gates, it's going to at least drive a lot of the early conversation. What are the big issues, if any, that it's that it's missing or that perhaps it's taking again, the wrong approach to or the wrong perspective on. What are the other issues that it doesn't cover that we need to pull into the conversation to get it started on the right foot? Or do you think it, by virtue of the approach it's taken, the philosophy it's embraced, which you've you've endorsed, do you think it's actually doing a good job kind of setting the stage for the debate that's to come? Yeah, I do think it's doing a good job for setting the stage for the debate. Um, and and so th- what I'm about to say is not a criticism of the report itself, but I think it's a point worth keeping in mind, given some public conversation that's occurred around the topic of Electoral Count Act reform. And that is, you know, I've, I've heard it voiced that if you constrain Congress so that Congress is obligated to accept what the states send, you know, what if the states send something that's renegade or gone rogue and that and that it defeats you know the will of the people in that state. And I think that's a valid point to raise, but I think a well-designed statute can handle it in this way. Again, we've again we're stuck with the electoral college system which does allow state legislatures to choose the method of appointment. But I think it's crucial to understand that state legislatures can't attempt a new method of appointment after they've already selected the popular vote as their chosen method. Why is that? Because the Constitution also says when Congress, Congress gets to set the time for appointing the electors themselves. So Congress says in early November, what we colloquially call election day, that's going to be when electors are appointed. States, you pick your method, but they're going to be appointed that day. So if in advance of election day, a state legislature says, we're going to use a popular vote to appoint our electors, and we're going to count our popular vote pursuant to these procedures, that's the state's chosen method. That's kind of locked in. And so the the electoral votes that eventually should get counted by Congress are electoral votes cast by electors appointed by that method chosen by the state legislature. That's the submission that should be identified and counted by Congress. If if a state legislature after election day in November said, we don't like the result, we want to appoint electors directly, and and claims that authority under Article 2, it's, it's too late. Yes, the state legislature had that authority, but they exercised that authority already and the appointment has occurred. And so I think a a well-designed Electoral Count Act should make clear there's only a single submission from a state that reflects the state's chosen method, in this case, namely a popular vote. And any other piece of paper that tries to come in later can't count because it's, it's not the state's chosen method. And even if it comes from the state legislature, it doesn't count because the state legislature already exercised its choice. So I recognize the concern about manipulation of the process in the states, but a well-designed statute, I think, can handle it, you know, for the reasons that I just stated. So this is, again, just kind of the first at bat in this debate, the first the first volley. Um, and what's going to be a long process of back and forth, it's probably going to last several months through at least the remainder of this Congress may well bleed into the next Congress before 2024. Uh, although I suspect there's going to be an effort, at least on the Democrats' part, to, to push activity in this front, um, particularly if their more ambitious proposals kind of fall apart. For those listeners who are want to keep track this issue and get a sense of where things are going, what should we be looking at? What is this process likely to look at? Do we have a sense of where the opening positions of Republicans who are open to these proposals are likely to be, where their red lines are? Or for that matter, the positions of the Biden administration that, to my knowledge, hasn't really engaged on this topic quite yet, but I may have missed something on that. How, how do you expect this process to proceed and what should we be looking out for to get a, the best sense possible about where it's going to end up? 
Yeah, I think the easiest thing to look for is that signal of bipartisanship. I mean, I think, um, you know, if, if we get to the point where we're seeing, you know, a specific statutory proposal, if it only has sponsors from one side of the aisle and not the other, you know, that would raise a concern in my mind, because I think even independent of the whole discussion of the Senate filibuster and so forth, this particular topic must be bipartisan because of the connection between the statute and the concurrent resolutions that I mentioned already. So, so the first thing to look for is, is, is a proposal going forward in a genuinely bipartisan way? And if so, that's really good, even if all the details haven't been worked out. If it's really only one side trying to advance its version of reform, that's a real danger sign in, in my mind. I think because there's some, you know, just unavoidable technical complexities associated with the whole electoral college system and how the electoral college system interrelates with state law, federal law, et cetera, et cetera, there, there may be good faith, sincere disagreements about what's the best technical way to achieve, you know, the overall philosophy that we've been talking about. But if if the philosophy embraced by this report goes forward in a bipartisan way, I think that's that's the main objective. And then the months that it may take to, to iron out all the technical nitty gritty details, they're going to be important before any new legislation is adopted, but probably not of major significance to the average citizen. Again, as long as that bipartisanship is built into the process, I, I think you could be you know, confident that anything that Congress were to adopt would be better than the current statute that we already have, which is why this reform is so important to achieve. Well, that is a, a pleasantly low bar by some measures, <laughs> but not necessarily uh, one that is is, uh, is guaranteed to be surpassed. Uh, regardless, I think the one thing we can be confident of is that we are going to have many, many opportunities to discuss this topic in the months and years to come before the end of this Congress and certainly before 2024. And hope we'll have the opportunity to have you back on again to revisit that. But until then, thank you for joining us here today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please take a moment to rate and share the Lawfare Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you might be listening. To gain access to our weekly Lawfare Live online discussions, an ad-free version of our podcast, and other benefits, please consider supporting Lawfare on our Patreon account at www.patreon.com lawfare. This podcast was engineered by Hamza Shatu of Goat Rodeo and edited by Jen Patcha Howell. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.